Welcome to the Legacy Pioneers Oral Initiative, a part of the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is Monday, September 11th, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. I'm here with Michelle Jordan, who will co-interview this oral history. Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Michelle Jordan. I am a current graduate student at the Palmer School of Library and Information Science and creator of the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative. Um, this initiative is spearheaded from the physical archival collection of my late grandfather, George Rodriguez, Community Advisory Board Chairman of Lincoln Hospital, and Bronx Community Board 1 for over 30 years. Um, the aim is to fully capture the voices, experiences, and spirit of community leaders of the South Bronx. So thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Diaz. Today we are joined by Hector Diaz, former Bronx County Clerk, former New York State Assembly member, former Bronx District Leader, former Commissioner of the Board of Elections for New York City, and a U.S. veteran. Welcome, Senor Diaz. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Would you would you like to introduce yourself or say anything that we didn't cover? I think that you actually did such a wonderful job introducing me. That, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Usually we like to start out all our oral histories by finding out about your family's history, their background. Where are your parents from? Um, my father. Uh, Vicente Diaz comes from Orocovi, Puerto Rico. Uh, my mother, Maria Luisa Rivera, she comes from um, Carolina. Uh, don't know where they met, but they fell in love and uh, they had four wonderful uh, children. And the second one of the children, there's three boys and one young lady. Um, the youngest, Fernand, passed away. Uh, passed away about uh, 15 years ago. He, he had gotten ill and um, his kidneys uh, were not uh, kidney failure and consequently um, passed away. Uh, my sister Carmen, she's still around. Uh, she um, was a um, teacher, New York City uh, teacher. Um, I was a dropout <laughs> from high school. Um, decided to join the army. Decided to uh, um, during the three years in the army, returning back home, um, went back to school. Well, in the service, you know, you take exams, and so I was able to um, complete my uh, high school diploma, and, uh, and then went on to college, and um, met the wonderful young lady, and we got married. Her name is Midian. Uh, Martinez is her last name. She was born here. Yeah, she wasn't born in Puerto Rico, but she, she, she um, her family was from Puerto Rico, so you know it's it's uh, it was great. Uh, she also was a school teacher, and principal, and um, and she um, a couple of years ago we decided that uh, it was time to retire. So we, we did so, we retired, and um, we're still residing in the Bronx. We have um, two wonderful children. Uh, one of them is uh, a dietitian, the youngest one, a dietitian, a nutritionist, and he also, um, Works for an agency where he helps children uh, understanding what to eat and what not to eat, and uh, he also cooks. He's a chef. Um, Jessica, my oldest, 
she went to work at the um, courthouse. So she's still employed at the courthouse. Uh, and that's a little bit about me. But uh, try to always be humble. Something that I learned from a gentleman by the name of uh, Jorge Rodriguez. Uh, <laughs> To be as humble as you can, you know, don't don't get yourself into titles because they come and they go. You know, just be you, mm-hmm. and that's who I am. Wow. Now, going back to Puerto Rico, can you tell us where and when were you born? I was born in 1943. Actually, it was 44, but my father registered me under 1943. See, in Puerto Rico at that time, you know, they used to send uh, whoever was going to... I was born in Carolina, but we actually lived in Santurce. Uh, So I was born in Carolina simply because my father Reminds me a little bit of George. Um, Dad used to come home at all type of hours, you know. So, so mom decided that I'm gonna have a second child, so I'm gonna go ahead and go move in with my parents. So she went to Carolina, and that's where I was born. Uh, so there was always a thing of. Was it 1943 or 1944? So uh, all along through my most of my life, I put 1944. Mm-hmm. Went into the army in 1944. Was applying for passport, and I needed my certificate of birth. I went to Puerto Rico to get one also because I wanted to see my uh, family. You know, my brother, the oldest. When we moved to New York, you know, dad came first. Then he sent for my mother. Uh, My sister and my brother, because they were the youngest one. I was 14 at the time. And uh, my uh, brother and sister were smaller than I. So the oldest, didn't come to New York. He stayed in Puerto Rico because he wanted to graduate mm. from La Universidad de Puerto Rico. And consequently, he got married and uh, completed his school, but stayed in Puerto Rico and never came. He used to come to visit, not to, uh, to stay. Mm. So uh, that's why I was born in Carolina, Puerto Rico. So I, it's, it's, it's in my heart, okay. Carolina. But grew up in San Dulce. Wow, but 14 years old, so you you should have, you know, lots of recollections. Can you tell us some of the earliest memories of growing up? We, we, it was Puerto difficult, Rico? you know, in Puerto Rico. At the time that I grew, grew up, there were no buses to take you to school. Oh. And the schools were not near the house. You had to walk. You had to get up in the morning early and uh, walk a lot to get to school on time. So the school, as I said, I lived in Santurce, and I was Parada Vente, Santurce, Puerto Rico, Parada Vente. And um, the school was in Parada (laughs) Vente. So so there was a train track. The train used to pass by there. And in Puerto Rico, you know, that's where they used to stop. Vente, la ventilos. But we didn't take the train to go to school. We didn't, couldn't afford it anyway. So we used to walk. And that's uh, Carrión Maduro was mm-hmm. my first school. Uh, growing up, you know, it was difficult. You know, we were poor, uh, four children. Uh, dad was the only one that was actually employed. And I think that if you made $15 a week, was a lot of money. 
the rent was cheap, you know, where we lived. And um, he was able to manage, but, you know, there was the pressure of trying to, you know, maintain a family. And uh, we were growing, and, you know, the good things to in Puerto Rico at that time, you know, the oldest was a male, so whatever uh, clothing he had that wouldn't fit it anymore, he fitted the next guy mm. and the next guy. So that's the way we used to actually manage. We um, ate well, you know, mom would cook whatever she was able to cook for us, you know. Uh, remember when Visitors used to come in, you know, you, you try to eat the meat first because <laughs> they will grab it and pass it on to yes. the person that was visiting, you know, so you end up eating your rice and beans, yeah. but, but, but the meat went to uh, the visitor, the family member who probably came to visit. So it was rough. So dad left, to come to New York, and... Um, he then sent for my mom, as I said, and my brother and sister, they were smaller. So they came. We moved into Fox Street and Prospect Avenue. And um, 564 Fox Street. And um, later, when they had a little bit of money and mom, moms then got a job, they were able to send for me. Uh, my brother, as I said, he didn't want to interrupt his studying, so he wanted to stay in Puerto Rico and uh, graduate, and he made his life in, the, in Puerto Rico, and uh, we came here. Uh, but growing up, you know, we uh, the beautiful thing about the uh, Diaz family was that my father was the uh, oldest and there was six or seven brothers and sisters. So they all like, my father moved to Santulce. So they also, they moved to Santulce. So, so there was always family around us. So, you know, being able to be with your cousins, it was a pleasure actually. You know, they were sort of like brothers more than, than, than cousins. So we all grew up um, fairly well. You know, we um, came to New York and the same thing happened. The members of the family began moving mm -hmm. to New York also. So it's, it's a family that was actually always um, together. So when I began having my children, I also wanted to show them that that's the way to go. You know, you look for your family, the raices, where are they? You know, make sure that the uh, cousin call them, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I left the army, came back home, and I'm um, looking for a job, got me a job in a clothing store. So um, one day as I'm at the uh, clothing store, a gentleman by the name of Ramon Velez comes by. You know, Ramon was a chubby gentleman. Uh, and my job was actually try to bring him into the store. And then, you know, so we conversed a little bit of time and I was trying to sell him a suit. And this was at 915 Prospect Avenue. It was Larry's men's clothing. And that's where I met uh, Ramon. And um, was unable to, to actually get something to fit him. So I lost the sale. But we kept in contact and um, because one of the things he asked me was, um, you know, about the schooling, you know, how far did you go in school? What are you doing? So I said, 
officers, this is all I do, you know, just uh, get out of the army um, a few months ago. So he says, well, you know, if you ever need a job, call me. So you, you know, you keep those type of things in mind. And um, I did call at one time, and um, he asked me to come and see him. We went to see him. Uh, he offered me a job. He says, you know, it's, uh, this is actually December. The job was supposed to become a job in January. So um, I quit the job that I had and uh, I waited. He called me and he said, why don't you come down anyway? Um, come in December, uh, we'll get you, you know, we'll get you some money and, uh, so, so that we can have some money. And, um, and then he began telling me about himself, you know, uh, he uh, enjoyed politics and he wanted to begin teaching younger, uh, young people, young he wanted to um, create sort of like an army of good willing and people who were into um, taking care of uh, our Latino community in the Bronx. Uh, he had created a Hunts Point Montmartre Service Center at that time. There was a new program that was going to come in, and it was mental health. Mm -hmm. So he asked me, you know, would you, how do you feel about working in that field? So I says, look, I'm here to work. You know, uh, tell me what I need to do, and uh, you know. So um, they were doing a little bit of construction in his office at the time. And um, that's how I met George, because he came by to visit Ramon. Mm. Uh, at that time, I don't, I don't know where Georgie, you know, Georgie had so many talents. Mucho talento, you know, you're a fast talking guy, good looking, you know, and, and uh, pray. So I met him, he, he introduced himself, and then he went in to see Ramon, because we were fixing his office. And Ramon, we had him, like here, you know, we had him in the back, and um, we would do the construction until I got my job in January. So I used to see George come in and out, you know. Uh, the time I think that George was working in housing on the west side somewhere and I think he wanted to somehow join Ramon and so um, so that's how it started so I started in the uh, mental health program and um, and went on to um, uh, the uh, substance abuse program, okay, and Ramon also said, you know, you need, you're going to need uh, to go back to school, so I yeah, went back to school, went to Hostos Community College, did two years there, and then I went to, uh, began looking around, and um, went to, uh, I forget the name of the college now. Mercy. Mercy. Mercy College. Uh, did my uh, two years more, and I did my four years at Mercy, at Mercy and uh, Hostess. So I was able to get a diploma, and um, now you know what do you do with all this uh, schooling? But I felt that somehow we were contributing 
to our community. And you know, that's what Ramon used to do, you know, Ramon and George and even my fellow American here. <laughs> uh, you know, you start building young minds mm. into what is actually needed in our communities. Mm -hmm. And there was actually the need of teachers, doctors, you know. So following Ramon's steps, because mm -hmm. you know you want to follow the leader. And the leader was into politics. So I got into politics. You know. So that was your first kind of step into the political world and community activism really. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what really inspired you to really fully get involved? And I know you're also a really big proponent about bilingual education and that importance. Because I know at the time too, um, that, that, was, that didn't exist. Can you talk a little bit more about why that um, is very important? To me, someone that actually, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like a shock coming into uh, from Puerto Rico mm -hmm. with one language. Because, you know, you learn, you do learn certain words in uh, Puerto Rico, but you don't, you don't learn enough to be actually able to converse. So, um, you know, you pick up as best as you can, you pick up, try to pick up the language. And that's one of the reasons that I think that I also wanted to join the army to, to, to actually be able to speak English better by moving away from Fox Street where the community was actually, you know, bilingual. Um, so, you know, it was actually, how can I benefit myself by learning mm -hmm. the language? And uh, you, start, you sort of like want to emulate the people that you see that have actually made it. Right. So, 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 you want to go ahead and, as young as I was at that time, wanted to imitate the Ramon Velas's and uh, the Federico Perez's and, and the uh, Georgie Rodriguez's. And so I met a young lady who was actually, uh, uh, at the time, she was an assistant teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, she became, uh, uh, a full-time teacher. She was actually a system uh, in school, an assistant, and then she became a teacher. Uh, she continued going back to school. She uh, was able to do two masters, and um, she actually ran the public school 25, which is actually a bilingual school. Uh, so that was the neighborhood, and you know, you just sort of like you wanted to give back, and that was always also on your mind because that's what Ramon and the others used to say. You know, uh, you can make it in life, but you have to give back. Yeah. I always said that you're going to be able to give back. So um, you know, that's how we began uh, giving back, helping the. Uh, people that were on substance abuse. Because mm -hmm. at that time, you know, Vietnam, uh, a lot of the guys used to come back all hooked up yeah. and drug and, and So we were there, you know, we were the soldiers that used to take them in and mm -hmm. bring them into the substance abuse programs and making sure that if they did mess up, you know, to go to court and talk to the judge, let, letting the judge know that is in a program that he would hopefully do better in life if you give him a chance to put him in jail, you know, it's gonna come out of this guy. So that's how we began. The, you know. Really with the activism and then mm -hmm. giving back to the community. 
everything in life is actually you have to give back. If you want to make it in life, somehow you have to definitely give back. You know, certain people can give back money. Mm -hmm. If they make it in life and they're making a lot of money, they can contribute that way. For others that don't have the ability to make that much money, they can give back knowledge. You know, so. I'd like to go back to the 14 year old who just got to Fox and Prospects. You know, what was that like? You're fresh out of San Jose. You know? Tell us, what was your yeah. first impressions? You know, what you saw and what did you think? Of your new neighborhood, it was, it was rough. Cause when I got in, uh, it stormed a lot, and uh, I got in on. I left with Rico in December thirty first. Got to New York on a January the first. So you know, I was traveling sort of like at night time. And to see snow, you know, blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, the mayor of Puerto Rico uh, was able to bring two planes with snow one time, and we were at a park. Many of the schools in the neighborhood, you know, San Dulce and San Juan, met at the park, Parque Sixto Escobar. And you know, she she sort of like introduced us to snow, but actually <laughs> melted very quickly. <laughs> but to come into a neighborhood and see, you know, Puerto Rico, you know, you have houses. Here you come to New York and you have buildings, you know, there's, and then the mixture of people in the building, you know, you had, you know, you have. Blacks, you have um, Latinos, you have, you know, Jewish, you had, so, so, so it was a mixture. So it was actually shocking, is the word shocking. But as I said, you know, you had, I had not seen my sister and my brother for a while, so it was actually wonderful to be able to see them, mm -hmm. mom and dad, you know to be able to come back home to them. So um, you, you learn how to deal with the situation. And I remember that um, I was going to public school 52 at the time, you know, and uh, you know, one of my experiences that I had, uh, you know, they, in Puerto Rico, they gave me a letter, you know, indicating the classes that I took, and it was sort of like a, um, a piece of paper with, with lots of info. Take it to them, and uh, my mother took me to public school 52, and uh, the um, lady that we met, she uh, says, you know, things are okay, but I don't see his vacuna. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, now, you know, they wouldn't accept me until I went back out mm -hmm. to try to get a vacuna. So uh, there was a lady that was very active, politically active during that time. Doña Evelina Antonetti. So, as we're coming out, my mom, she's already crying, you know, I can't get out of school, what am I gonna do? And this lady was listening, and she says, mire señora, vaya a Evelina Antonetti, allí en la esquina, prospect, which is not a couple of blocks away. There's a lady by the name of Evelina Antonetti and speak to her. She um, she might be able to help you guys. So mom took us to see Doña Evelina Antonetti. Amazing human being. And this is 
my first talking about experiences. She picked up the phone, uh, called the school, and when she called, she says, I want to speak to uh, the principal. And the principal is that of, get me the assistant principal. So, and then she says, you know, this is Evelina. Dice, bueno, yo le veo la vacuna. Yo no sé quién ustedes, ustedes están uh, ciegos. No, no ven la vacuna del niño. El niño tiene una vacuna. And the woman on the other phone says, send them back quick. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get them. So I went back to the school. And they went ahead and they took me in. So I will never forget this woman, Doña Evelina. Okay? La doctora Evelina. No, Federico didn't hear that. La doctora Evelina Antonetti. Ah, sí, sí. So we went back. They went ahead and they accepted me in school. Mm -hmm. They couldn't see my vacuna. Ah. So they told me that I couldn't go to PS52 because I um, needed to go ahead to uh, the Department of Health to get una vacuna because they were not able to see that the shot. That vacuna used to sort of like leave uh, a... I, I, still, I still have it, but the woman wouldn't, uh, couldn't see it. So they had said, no, we won't take the child in until he gets vacuna. So um, Doña Evelina Antonetti made a phone call and was able to, uh, so, you know, through my life, that phone call, this woman with a position was able to make a quick phone call to people who she knew at the school and how quickly they changed the mind and they saw my vacuna who they, they couldn't see before. So um, it, that was my first sort of like political experience in life, you know, with a phone call. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. She was great. She was great. Oh, the woman was actually an amazing human being. Mm -hmm. You know, later in life you begin mm -hmm knowing who Do Doña Evelina Antonetti was. Mm -hmm. You know, I was sort of like this lady's son. You know, I think that God plays a game with us. Uh, uh, this woman sending us to see a Doña Evelina. Mm -hmm. Me learning about Doña Evelina at the moment and seeing her reaction by taking the phone call, you know, making the phone call. And, getting me into school great moment for me but later on in life as you begin learning about the community then you say wow Doña Evelina Antonetti mm -hmm. you know this great woman who was able to do this for me and we we, we I visit her many times uh, when she was still alive and active at that agency that she had. Uh, later in life, you know, when I became known, uh, it was wonderful being able to, to sit down with this woman mm -hmm. and talk. Mm -hmm. wow. So impressions in life, sometimes, you know, they leave. Yes. You know. Now that young 14 year old back on Prospect, your friends, what? What kind of games yeah, or activities did you play outside of school? You know, as a, outside of school, we play stickball, you know, which was actually what uh, at the time, you know, we, uh, we couldn't go see, see a game, although the Yankees said it wasn't far away. But it was, in, uh, it was actually on the, on the other side of, uh, at the time, you know, it's not where the location where he's at now. Mm -hmm. It was actually on the ball grounds on the other side. Actually in Manhattan more than in the Bronx. Uh, so we played stickball and uh, you know, you play games with the kids you know. and then, you know, uh, watching all these guys returning back and getting into drugs and, you know, you 
Yeah. So, but he, he, he was learning the spirits. Did you did you witness any gang activity in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, that's it. All the all the uh, different, uh, you know, from my block to uh, Avenue St. John. Okay, from Prospect to Avenue St. John, the Cavaliers were the uh, gang members, you know, Caballeros, Los Caballeros, Los Cavaliers, and beautiful sweaters at the time, you know, they, they uh, not too many guys uh, had guns, you know, they, 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 they fought, <laughs> they, 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 you know, they fought, you know, they used to fight, uh, fist fighting and uh, anything that you can grab and hit the, uh, so from um, crossing the street from Avenue St. John right up to, uh, before you get to Simpson Street, not that I'm talking about Fox Street, it, yeah, was, yeah, uh, it was the sinners, okay, this guy's the, uh, by the nipple of your, your guy's breast, they wore a, uh, a ring, yeah. so those were the sinners. Uh, from Simpson on was the crowns. So, so you know, like each block had territory. <laughs> had, 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 yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they, they had their land marked and, and, right. and, and you walked, you don't know, you know, you walk by the wrong street. You get beat up, <laughs> and so you either learn how to fight or learn how to run. So you, it, it was either one of those, you know. So, so, so that was life. That you sort of like, as I said, learning, experience, yeah. Yeah, los cocotazos, and the, uh, you know, so, so, you know, learn how to fight a little bit, you know. So, you know. Rough time during the late '60s and throughout the entire '60s, even going on into the '70s. But it it was a time of some really great new music that was popping up here in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Everything from salsa, you know, oh, to, yeah. to the beginning of hip hop. Can you tell us about the musical experiences that you enjoyed growing up in high school? Hip hop was actually after my time. Right, right. right. It was actually more Latin. You know the okay. uh, the the. Uh, Guys with the trombones, it was more salsa type of thing, you know. That that was actually my time. We had uh, festival, yeah, huh? on the fifty-six festival, right? Oh no, but they, they, those came after. Yeah, you know, this is this is actually you know, Not before, yeah. when when you as I came in to oh, Fox Street, you know, you know in the fifties, mm -hmm. late fifties. So, so that it, it was more salsa and 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 uh, family throwing parties and inviting you know, people from the neighborhood and you know meeting the young ladies and and, and 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 the young ladies meeting the boys from the neighborhood. You know, that's how you survive. You know. did, did your family get involved with the los asociaciones los asociaciones de, de los pueblos? My 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 um, parents didn't do that. That that we learned through the other father that I had, which was Ramon Velas, and through the Georgia Rodriguez's, and through the social clubs that almost um, different towns used to have an association, and they used to play music and they used to play. Uh, uh, dominoes all the time and uh, uh, funny that we were talking about that before we came you know because you you have actually lost that mm. you know those groups of people that used to uh, you know La Bellonera with all the music at the time you know and, uh, so it was wonderful growing up because you you know it's, you bring back the sabor Boricua into the community, and now you know you, you 
you're, you're learning and uh, you're growing and uh, that's what you're going to be telling your children mm. and this is the way to be you know this is mm -hmm. that's awesome could you talk to us about going into Morris High School and your experiences there uh, Morris was a tough high school uh, the schooling was in rough. It was actually the atmosphere, the the the, 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 the you know young the uh, older guys beating up on the younger groups, and, and uh, there was a, a guy who killed you know one guy right outside Morris High School, a guy with the with a black uh, kappa, you know, and it was all over the newspapers. And, yeah. So he gave Morris a bad name, but Morris was a school that was actually good. I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, you, know, you go in to actually try to learn and you try to do the best you can. and. Uh, Teachers say, you know, your English is not that great. You know, you got to work on this, you got to work on that. But, but everything works out, you know. But, but it was wonderful. You know, it's, it's, I'd, I'd still pass by, you know, from time to time just mm -hmm. to see the old school. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son goes to, uh, they have an area where they, uh, in the back, uh, where we used to, um, we, where we had gym, and in the back they fixed the place up, and now it's a lot different. Uh, so in the back now they have, um, in the grounds they have areas where people can, uh, uh, you know, learn how to actually uh, garden different type of zucchinis and uh, different type of uh, vegetables and uh, so my son helps them do that so uh, he takes me says I want you to see Morris the way it is now you know, so, so. <laughs> but it's a uh, it's rough but good at the same time mm -hmm. rough and good sometimes works okay yeah. Do you go to next? yeah I mean you mentioned a lot about having people like my grandfather, George Rodriguez, kind of like as father figures or people in leadership positions like um, Avilina Antonetti and your experiences with that, um, you observing this growing up, what was it about their leadership style that you respected and really motivated you to get involved? And did you feel a lot of it was based in, like you were saying, that strong Puerto Rican identity to want to improve the quality of life. I think that it was actually more than anything was that the fact that they also grew up in Puerto Rico. Right. They probably uh, also grew up poor. Uh, they had to work very hard in their lives to actually make it here. Uh, so when you meet people that have actually done that in their lives, right. you know, work so hard to make it, uh, you sort of like want to, as I said before, you want to imitate. You mm -hmm. want to be able to do the same thing that they do. Right. Uh, because you see them as leaders in a community. So I want to be like that leader, you know. and. Um, I told you that I've worked at a clothing store, so I had the ability to see how people who dress as well, you know, how people actually see them. Right. People in the community see them, you know, you, you wear a tie and you have a jacket on and, and you wear a suit and, and people would see you as, you know, higher than what you are. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an image that you're projecting, yeah. you know, to the younger generation, you know, when you see that, you don't want to imitate. Mm -hmm. So your dad, George, 
was always like that. Ramon was always very well dressed also. It's just that, you know, uh, Georgia was a little thinner, so you looked a little bit, you know, physically better than Ramon, who was a little husky. But they gave you that, that, that image that you should be that, you know, and um, you want to follow through. You want to follow through. And, um, you know, once you begin working with Ramon, who wanted to become a uh, commerce man, and you work on their uh, elections, mm -hmm. you begin understanding the election, mm -hmm. and you actually trying to um, put the psyche in mind that your, your job, if you, you know, this man is going to make it in politics, he's going to be able to bring jobs into the community, okay? At the time, we were working also trying to get hostess going, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Ramon became a councilman, mm -hmm. and he used to use people like me, and I'm quite sure that uh, people like Federico, to go to meetings on his behalf, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, because I got into those type of meetings, mm -hmm. I wanted to be one of the first ones to go to Hustos, who was supposed to have been a Puerto Rican school, uh -huh. okay, college. Yeah. So, you know, you want to be one of the first ones because you are connecting Hustos, and then the other connection was actually to the hospital, you know, we had the mm -hmm. old Lincoln Hospital, the old fights that, that uh, the community had because they were not giving, you know, you went into the hospital at that time. They didn't have uh, sheets and they didn't have uh, a lot of things that they didn't have and, and they didn't have a good reputation, so not good doctors were going to uh, Lincoln Hospital. It was actually through the fighting, community fighting, trying to get better, a better hospital. Uh, and by having a better hospital, you know, you're going to try to bring money into the community yeah. so that they can construct the hospital, the college. Construction brings jobs. Right. And that's what you want to be able to give to your community. And then, you know, try to get them into um, schooling so that they can actually learn, you know, electrical work. Uh, we at Hunts Point had a, uh, Hunts Point Multiservice, we had the um, uh, program where they used to teach youngsters to become, uh, if, you know, if you like, uh, Electricity, electrical work, plumbing, uh, construction. We did all that stuff. We wanted to make sure that people learn those trades. Mm -hmm. And the other idea that we had, but it didn't actually made it, was actually since we had the substance abusers in place, okay, you, we wanted to go ahead and teach them how to and begin fil you know, filtering them into the hotels, mm -hmm. you know, so, so that, that's how, you know, the type of things that you learn. And, you know. Right, really navigating the political landscape, how everything is interconnected, and then having that seep into the community and really meeting those needs at the time. So, so you know, so you want, as I said, you want to emulate. Right. So, I wanted to go ahead and run for a district leader, oh. which is actually the first. Uh, you don't get paid for being a leader in your community, mm -hmm. but you learn the traits that uh, the Ramon, the George, and the others were able to teach us. So, so you know, we had the uh, 
I became uh, the uh, leader in the 78th Assembly District at that time. And, you know, hoping that, you know, if I can just keep it going and getting people elected, and that eventually I would be elected also. You know, people will, you know, you work on people's campaign, you know, the, uh, the uh, people that got elected, then you'll go and tell them, you know, this is what I'd like to do. Uh, and you try to see if they can actually help you get elected also. So. Great. Uh, graduating or moving on to the U.S. Army, can you tell us what your first military occupational specialty was? <laughs> and where were you assigned? Okay. I, um, I joined the Army with a couple of friends from high school. Uh, we decided that uh, when we began seeing what was happening with the youngsters, you know, uh, and the gangs, that sort of like pushed us into joining the army. So we joined the army. Um, uh, at the time, they had what they used to call the buddy system, basic training. You know, you 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 go take basic training with your friends. Uh, what we didn't know, we thought that we were going to stay together, three of us, throughout the three years that you signed up for. But it wasn't like that. It was just basic training together. Then you go to special type of training, and then you go to different places. So um, began in New Jersey, Fort Dix, ended up in Kentucky. Ended up into Germany. One of the things that I, that I also learned was, you know, here's the uh, sergeant speaking about uh, your men uh, going into uh, Europe. So we're going to give you a form to fill out. So you guys are going to Europe, most likely Germany. They, they were telling us mm -hmm. what they wanted us to put down. Some of my friends say, nah, I'm going to put Hawaii. <laughs> I'm going to put the Philippines. Yeah. Those guys ended up going to the Philippines and Hawaii. Me, I was a dummy. The man is telling me where I'm going to land, so why is it that I'm going to go ahead and put something else? He's telling me what I'm, what they're gonna send me. Lesson number one: you don't, you hear what you want to hear, mm -hmm. but you're a master of yourself. So don't, don't don't get tricked into, you know. So so, so my friends ended up going to other places. I ended up going to uh, Germany and spending my time in Germany. Uh, I was on. I was on, I ended up going into um, a uh, place that actually has those type of things. Right. Ooh. And uh, it wasn't my thing, so um, they were also looking for guards, you know, for MP, Ooh. military police. So, so, so. Uh, I put my hand up and I went instead of uh, dealing with the uh, guys that were actually doing the uh, bombs and all that stuff. Ended up uh, being a uh, MP. So my job is to go, you know, go to town and get all the guys that were drunk mm -hmm. and bring them back to base. And uh, <laughs> you know, when they were fighting, you know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I also got slick. You know, I'm short, so you know, I got the the uh, tallest black guy that I could find, who was my, uh, balance. yeah, balance, you know. <laughs> so, things that you learn, you know, just, just uh, to survive. So, um, MP in Germany, uh, you know, and I figured that I can transfer that into being a police officer in New York City when I came back. But I was still short. 
you know, uh, at that time they had the um, five nine, and then w which I passed the exams, and uh, I ended up going into um, the post office. They, we began taking exams when we came back. You know, they, what am I going to do now? You know, I don't have no legal experience. I can't be a police officer. I'm too short. So, um, you know, we ended up going into the post office. Eh, and then you say, you know, is this what I want to be? You know, remember that I got a badge. You know, they give you a badge. You know? And to my father, that meant a lot. You know, that I got a job with the post office. He foresaw me doing, you know, 20 years in in the post office. There was a gentleman in the building also who had been in the post office for many years. And I guess my father respected him and, and he thought that that's what I should uh, be. But it wasn't my thing. I, I, I enjoy getting paid every week, <laughs> not every two weeks. So that was my excuse to uh, uh, you know, stayed for a while at the post office and then went to work at the clothing store. I used to get paid every week. Hey, somos uno. Oh, no, that's, a, that's another. Uh, that's a very important issue. That no, no, no. <laughs> so, so, um, so, you know, I came out of the army, I sent to uh, yeah, and I just couldn't be a police officer, uh, you know, later in life, you know, where I was doing something else more important than I was tall enough to be a police officer. You don't <laughs> want to go ahead and go back in life. You know, you always go forward, never backwards. So, Were there any other jobs you had before politics? you know, that you'd like to talk to us about? Uh, before politics and before going to the uh, the Army, yeah, my father, you know, I was able to get a job at a uh, grocery store, taking the, uh, at that time, you know, they, they had the bottles. Mm -hmm. they, they had, the, you know, they used to give you a couple of cents for the bottles. So my job was actually to, to, to take the, um, boxes of uh, empty boxes of soda, bring them down to the basement, bring the uh, sodas back up, put them in the freezer for the gentleman. Uh, it was a bodega right on Prospect and Fox. So um, the gentleman who owned the bodega was telling me that, uh, you know, that it was rough and, you know, he needed someone so I recommended my father. I said, you know, my dad learned how to work. You know, he knew he was a sort of like a butcher without a uh, diploma. Mm -hmm. But he knew all that stuff, you know, because he used to work in a restaurant in Puerto Rico and he knew how to do all that stuff. So I got my father a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> The worst thing that I've ever done, because now my father wanted me to be at the store. You know, at the store, I used to be there uh, twice a week, and I used to make a couple of dollars. It wasn't much at that time. But now my father forced me to be at the store every day <laughs> with the same salary. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, yeah. So my father stayed working there for a long time. And then another member of the family owned, who owned the restaurant uh, got my father a job. But then, and then, you know. But don't get your father a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can you tell us when you, what year you first got elected to the New York State Assembly? Uh, I got elected on a special election. It was actually uh, May, May 19, 1970. 
1983. Uh, the gentleman by the name of Luis Nini. See what happens in, in, in uh, politics. And during the time that we grew up, you know, there was only five elected members in the New York State Assembly of Puerto Rican descent. Okay? There was three from the Bronx, one Brooklyn, and one Manhattan. Okay? Uh, there was uh, Jose Serrano as a member of the Assembly. There was a gentleman who had just gotten elected at the time, uh, Jose Rivera. Uh, Louis Nini passed. I took his place. So there was Hector Diaz, Jose Rivera, Jose Serrano, Victor Robles, Brooklyn, and there was a gentleman by the name of um, no, Montana, this is after Montano oh, I lost. Know. I don't want to go into the oh, okay. fights with Montano. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, there was a gentleman by the name of Montano uh, that you mentioned. You. And um, he was he was not, you know, he was not doing the job that we expected him to do. Uh, one of the things that I remember was that he used to throw, you know, his office it was always my club, Democratic club. Mm -hmm. Since I said that I was a district leader, my club was underneath, and he used the offices on top where his district office was at. And the man always had meetings in his office. And he used to buy all the food from this gentleman. Hombre humano poor guy from, from the corner that had this small restaurant and he used to tell him that Albany was going to be paying the bill. So the man you know, used to give him all the arroz con pollo, all that good stuff and um, we felt that he wasn't doing his job besides doing this guy, this, this, this group of people that used to, uh, you know, we, we, Boricuas, they used to enjoy gallos, the fighting of gallos in the basement. They had different locations where they used to have, you know, gallos fighting, you know. And that, of course, you know, that is illegal. You know, okay. as a, so they used to give money to the gentleman that he spoke about, Mr. Montano, to pass a bill in the legislature to, to actually, you know, so that they can actually gamble. And, and he used to tell them that he would go ahead and pass a bill and not to worry about. So he used to take the monies. And those were the type of things that, you know, we didn't like. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, uh, you know, the leadership, mm -hmm. those that held elected office, uh, began talking, you know, and they said, you know, they got rid of so-and-so, this guy's bad, this guy, he's not doing his job, you know, there was a big meeting in, 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 in Albany and uh, the chairman of the housing committee whose Montano didn't show uh, because it was snowing, he didn't show. And so, so, you know, you hear people talking. So then that uh, Nini, who is actually uh, having, uh, he was sick, he had cancer. And the people that the main people that are cutting the map, okay, began forcing, saying, okay, so we'll have Serrano running against uh, whoever the opposition would be. 
Montano, so we're going to have him running against Nene. He felt that he could beat the man because the man was dying. So, you know, so uh, Montano has a son also by the name of Amanda Montano Jr., who was a, an attorney at the time. So he ran against Jose Serrano mm -hmm. because that was the district it was going to be divided. Mm -hmm. So Monty decided to run against uh, a gentleman that is sick mm -hmm. and was going to be passing away. But the people in the neighborhood care for that man who was sick and was going to mm -hmm. die. He, he had Arabic. Arabian, uh, that's why the name Nini. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, he grew up in Maya, West Puerto Rico, so to us it was Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, what happened was that Nini won against Montano. Serrano won against Montano Jr. So, you know, so the big fight of mm -hmm. all these people. Um, so that's the way he ended. Uh, Serrano beating Junior, uh, a gentleman who was going to pass away, didn't die, so he beat people who voted for him, so they beat Monte. So then after, in March 14th, around that time, he passes away. That's our birthday, <laughs> March 14th. Oh, wow. So to me, it was a sign that this is your time. Mm -hmm. The man, gentlemen, who suffer and didn't make it, now he passes away in March. May is going to be the election. This is your chance. So I'll call Sir Ramon and says, I've been loyal to you all these years, you know. Uh, you can look at like, all the leaders. Mm -hmm. I've been loyal to you. I got you elected. We worked on your uh, uh, signatures. We got you a whole bunch of signatures so that you could be elected. Now I need help. Mm -hmm. So they all say yes. We have been in so many campaigns, campaigning for, uh, you know, including a gentleman by the name of Ramon Bellis. Uh, including a gentleman by the name of uh, your father, your grandfather, who ran for city council. Mm -hmm. Everything in life has its time. Mm -hmm. There's a time. Mm -hmm. If you're not into that time, sometimes time passes you by. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the... Um, <coughs> There's a gentleman that we helped become a city council member mm -hmm. by the name of Fernando Ferrer. Freddy, as we would, uh, we, uh, Freddy was engaged into a brand new, he cut the lines for city council. Mm -hmm. Freddy, um, was running. Freddy somehow he didn't like Ramon. Mm -hmm. The leadership in the Bronx told Freddy, you gotta deal with Ramon. He didn't really want to deal with Ramon, so Ramon sort of like understood. You know, there's certain people that you know don't want to socialize with me. Mm -hmm or have any association with me. But they like Hector. So Hector, you are in charge of Freddy. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure that you call him. You gotta make sure that uh, he um, respond to you and keep you informed as to how is the election going. Mm -hmm. At the time, you know, you have, in order to qualify, you need to have signatures, people signing your petition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, council districts, you know, you end up having certain districts on different assembly districts. Uh, 
Okay, so um, the situation with Freddie was that he had assembly woman of Rayleigh Green district, one portion. Assembly woman Gloria Davis, another what, you know, number of ED's election districts. Mm -hmm. And like that. But somehow with Freddie, you know, he used to call people and they used to say, nah, your petitions are going well, your petitions are going well. So that was the feedback to me was that his petitions were going well. <clears throat> I reported to Ramon, the petitions are doing well. And Ramon would report to the county chair at the time, okay, his petitions are going well. Mm -hmm. This is a Friday, election is Tuesday. Peti well, not the election was Tuesday. The petitions needed to be at the Board of Elections on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So now we have to make sure that what he was saying to us, you know, that he had enough signatures to qualify. Because mm -hmm. you have to have a number of signatures to be able to qualify. So Aurelia collected a few, not too many pages for Fernando. Gloria had gotten no signature. She didn't like him. <laughs> Very, you know, a lot of people liked him, a lot of people didn't like him. You know, it's a fact of life. We were talking about Ramon, people would like him, and certain people didn't like him. So in life is that way, you know, not everyone is going to like you. So we find out that Freddie didn't have sufficient number of signatures to qualify. Now I have to tell Freddie, you don't have enough signatures to qualify. I'm going to talk to Ramon to see what Ramon says. Because mm -hmm. he doesn't want to talk to Ramon, so I have to go in. Ramon says, OK, what we're going to do is today's payday. It's a Friday. He began calling people in, the staff in, I need you to do me a favor. Now, Ramon has to ask people to do him, Ramon, a favor and go out and collect signatures for Freddie. So we had maybe about 40, 50 people going into the forum area mm -hmm. to collect signatures for Freddie, you know, they have a couple of big stores, mm -hmm. clothing stores, uh, up by Forum, so you know, we located, we put tables and uh, put people out there. <clears throat> we were able to have enough signatures to qualify Fred Fernando Pereira. Wins the elections, everything is going well. As I said, the gentleman who was actually the assemblyman where, where Freddie came out of his political club mm -hmm. dies. So I go over to see Freddie, who promised that he would kiss my back <laughs> in front of everyone when he won his election. Mm -hmm because he wanted, because we were able to get the uh, signatures that he needed. So he was close to, well, Freddie was close to a woman that used to work for Assemblyman Nini. And somehow he had said to her that he was going to go ahead and back her. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you say, you see, you learn. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I told the um, chairman of the county, remember what I told you about that woman with one phone call? Yes. This gentleman called and says, you owe it to him. So he had to go ahead and endorse me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a special election. 
<clears throat> actually there was two special elections in two different counties so I won my election and another gentleman who was running at the other location that had a vacancy we he won and I won so now you get to Albany but you get a phone call you better get there before he gets there so that you'll have you know you'll sign in before right. him so that you can have you, you know, you're able to select mm -hmm. the office that you want and I want you to select the office next to so and so mm -hmm. you know so to be protected mm -hmm. uh, the chairman of the party wanted to make sure that I was protected so I try to get to Albany before the other guy did you? so politics did you, did you, uh, did you make it? Uh, yes. who was the, who was the uh, opponent of Freddie oh. Weber? Oh, in 1985. I don't, you know, to be honest with you. Federico Perez. He was this bar for 62 petitions. The Bronx County. Uh, uh, Federico, uh, right. Federico I, lost I was, uh, a couple. No, but uh, that one in 1985. <laughs> I, was, I was a candidate running against Freddy Ferrer and against all of you even against Ramon, I collected petitions, I went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, this, this, at the last minute, said, you, have, you don't have enough petitions. By 62 petitions, they disqualify. That was a travesty, yes. that was a travesty of justice yeah. in the world. It, it happens, and it also happened, <laughs> and it also happened on an election that Federico and I worked for Ramon, yeah. Where Todo the gentleman that was running against them, Don Gerena Valentin, who was actually another leader, very well uh, liked. Federico, I'm talking about Gerena Valentin. Oh, yeah. So, elections, you know, you, you, you go through the process of collecting your signatures, you turn them into the Board of Elections. The Board of Elections sends the uh, petitions to uh, the Bronx. You know, you got to qualify at the main office in Manhattan. They send them to the Bronx. People look through them to see if people that sign your signature, they are registered Democrats mm -hmm. within your district. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, those that qualify stay those that don't qualify they take them out of your your, your list consequently the gentleman that was running against Ramon we beat him he didn't have sufficient signatures to qualify but since Ramon this is politics since Ramon had ran against a congressman from the Bronx at the time. The two the petitions that didn't qualify, they got a group of people to sign a letter saying that that was unjustified. What happened to Federico was unjustified. But what happened to Herena? They said that it was unjustified because they had signed a petition for the gentleman. So we had a contest. Okay, I was telling you about Friday, and the petition is Tuesday. So we never, with Ramon, we never went out to tell the people, you know, the guys off the ballot, don't worry about it. We didn't, we didn't campaign because Actually, we had defeated the guy in court. Uh, now, the highest court right. sent it right. back on a Friday saying we're reinstating him because uh, certain people claim that they, uh, <laughs> uh, it was an injustice not to. So they put him in on a Friday. So now we, the man used to complain all the time. Right. We used to laugh. Say, what is he doing? What? <laughs> I had never said this before. What is he doing? He's campaigning. He can't campaign. He's out. 
and he was put in at the last moment. And he beat us by about 125 votes. Oh my goodness. So those are things in life that you never, you know, you try to campaign all the way. Right. Even if you don't have an, <laughs> an opponent, you're always campaigning. Right. Okay? Uh, so things that you learned in life. Mm -hmm. Never to give up, you know, to continue the fight mm -hmm. and to try to make it. Mm -hmm. So 1983, May 1983, I was elected. And um, in life, you know, is this what I want to be, an assemblyman all my life? I had gone for jury duty one time. I went into the courthouse, you know, we... we because judges also run for office, and you got to get them elected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we began getting people elected, judges elected. And uh, going to the courthouse for jury duty, men, judge, so and so and so, you know, you begin talking, and they say, hey, Hector, you know, there's a big joke here in the court system. We haven't seen the gentleman who uh, is the county clerk, you know, maybe you should begin thinking that. So I said, county clerk, what, what the is it? I knew what a county clerk was, but I never thought of it as a job for me. So, you know, I said, yeah, let me begin looking at the books. County clerk, and he makes, at the time, $105,000. I'm an assemblyman and I'm making $36,000 and we're going to hopefully go into about $59,000. I said, wow, that's a hell of a good job. So the judges, they throw things at you at times, you know, so you keep it and you do the research. So I said, this gentleman has been in office since uh, Leo Levy. He was in office since 1959, I think it was. Been in office all his life. So I said, you know, that, that, that yeah. So I began telling people, mm -hmm. you know, when you meet with your colleagues and uh, I'm gonna run for Senate, I'm gonna run mm -hmm. for this, I'm gonna run for that. Hey, Hector, how about you? Mm -hmm. I said, ah, you know what? I want to be a county clerk. <laughs> That's what I want to be, a county, county clerk. <laughs> and you know that I have done the research. Yeah. The salary is like going into Congress. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to have a good have paying it. job. So I began putting, like the old man used to say, la semilla. Mm -hmm. Okay, the seed into the ground. Mm -hmm. So now let's see if he grows and, and what type of tree you're gonna get or what type of vegetable you're gonna get. So the whole thing was actually, you know, letting people know that I was interested, that if the guy ever, because it's a job for life. life. Right. It's a job for life. I couldn't take the guy out. Right. He doesn't run for office. So it was actually, you know, putting the seed into the ground and then, you know, talking to people so that they would know what I would want. And you know, you do a lot of favors for people. So, you know, then you call, you know, the gentleman, uh, Are uh, not Aurelia Green, he was actually Gloria Davis, whose uh, friend used to be a judge. Um, she called me up and she says, Hector, do you know that this gentleman, the county clerk, is going to be leaving? I says, no, I didn't know. So she says, your job, it's your job. So I began, you know, once again, or before, you know, I just put the seed in, right. just to see what it was going to grow, and I had put a little bit of water so that it would grow. Right. Now I began making phone calls. He mm -hmm. said, you know, my understanding is that this gentleman is going to leave. He says, you know, man, the history of uh, the state, 
we never had, had a Puerto Rican county clerk. I want to be the next county clerk. So, people that you had done favors for, they make a phone call. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, Hector is my candidate. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Supreme Court, okay, the appellate division. I told, I gave you a name of a gentleman mm -hmm. who, who is Puerto Rican, who is a dear friend of your um, grandfather. Mm -hmm. He wasn't there yet, but I'm just saying. So um, people began calling the person that had that job mm -hmm. at the appellate division, because mm -hmm. the appellate division is the one that actually appoints. Mm -hmm. and this is an appointment. Wow. Uh, okay. So um, about seven or eight people went for the interview, mm -hmm. and um, I end up with the job. But it was simply because, you know, you actually know what you actually want in life. Right. And then you begin making those phone calls and one phone call might have been able to do that for me. I don't know whoever it was, but one phone so call must have. Kind of like a full circle moment, right? Right. From the right. beginning. That's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. Yeah. And I, the person who I think that did that for me. Rudy Giuliani oh. was actually indicting this gentleman, my <laughs> Democratic friend, mm -hmm. Judy, it's a Republican. And one of the reasons they they got him they got him on was actually because they asked, you know, to 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 raise uh, million dollars uh, how did you go about raising a million dollars and the gentleman said one phone call <laughs> with one phone call mm -hmm. and uh, Rudy got him indicted oh my and gosh. he uh, ended up going to jail for a little bit of time and he came back and tried to revive his uh, life. Right. He didn't have a political position, mm. but he was a great attorney. Mm. And he had the clients like the Trumps and those people mm. with plenty of money. So, so one phone call, that's all he needs. Okay? Sometimes that's all it is. <laughs> So that's how I uh, became the uh, county clerk. Mm -hmm. And then a group of crazy people come in and they see me and they says, the city clerk of the city of New York has a vacancy. We want you to, to be the uh, next city clerk. Now, this is a little bit different mm -hmm. because the first Puerto Rican city clerk was a gentleman that came out of our club. Okay. Oh. So he had lost his job because this is actually a job, you know, you get appointed by the city council of the city of New York, which is a six year job. Mm -hmm. And the people that we had, Carlos Cuevas, the Honorable Carlos Cuevas, was the first city clerk that we had. There was a gentleman, remember that I was telling you about a guy from Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. The guy from Brooklyn, Victor Robles at the time, uh, he had left the assembly, mm -hmm. went into the city council. And he wanted to become the uh, city clerk. Mm -hmm. So Victor was the second city clerk we had. You know, what happened was the person that is in charge of the city council was running for mayor of the city of New York. 
And at that time, they must have been around 12 to 15 Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. members of the city council. Mm -hmm. And Victor Robles told this gentleman that Carlos Cuevas, okay, was going to be voting for Fernando Ferrer, okay, and okay, they, they, they held a meeting with all the Latinos in the city council, and the chairman began asking, who are you endorsing me? Are you endorsing me? Are you endorsing me? Are you endorsing me? When he came down to Carlos, Carlos says, you know, well, you know, I, I have, um, you know, I have Freddie running in my, in the Bronx. Uh, he had asked me, I haven't said yes yet. So the chairman at that time decided that you know, I can't trust Carlos. So Carlos already had had about eight years. Mm -hmm. The term is six. Nothing had actually happened in between those times. So he says, okay, as of Monday, clean up your, 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 your stuff. So he fired him because he could. Yeah. So he fired Carlos Cuevas, then Victor Robles became the city clerk of the city of New York. And so the guys from the Bronx, okay, oh, and by the way, today, September, September 9th, today, September 11th, 11, 11, September 11th, 11, today. Was a, it, it was an election day. Yeah. Today was an election day, 2001. 22 years ago. And Freddie was running for mayor. That's what we're talking about, that election. Yeah. Okay. Now, Freddie could have made it. Okay. I you think that he could have, have beat Bloomberg at the time. Uh, so that happened right before that election. Yeah. Okay. So Victor Robles became the uh, city clerk. So the guys from the Bronx always remember that he's the one that turned Carlos in because he wanted his job. So they waited at the right moment when there was a new council coming in. Yeah. They were voting for a new council president. So the deal was, you got to get this guy out. So it, they did that to Victor, what he did to yeah. Carlos. So then there was a hey, job man. open, and they wanted me to uh, take the job. So I took it, but I told them, you know, I don't know if I'll be staying. I don't know. This was the time that I wanted a change in life. I wanted to go back mm -hmm. into my roots of being able to uh, run Homespun Multi Service that was going down at the time. Georgie didn't want to, you know, he had, he was tired. He did the best he could, you know, to keep it alive. But there was another agency that was that is very well known at the time, Promesa. Promesa. Okay. And the only way that uh, the people from Promesa would make a deal was if I was part of the deal. Aww. So I gave up being the city clerk mm -hmm. of the city of New York to become the uh, uh, person who actually got Promesa and a small entity that we had at the time married together to create the agency that we now have. Okay. Oh, of course, everything changes names, but 
Promes are still within the uh, illegal. Yeah. And the chamber. Yeah. And that was the beauty of your grandfather. Your grandfather was a um, thinker. You know, I, I, I think that he actually wrote the rubber boots of the world. So he actually rubber boots of order. order, which is actually how the kneading oh. is done. Right. I think that, that Georgie Rodriguez wrote that book because yes, there was actually very few people I knew mm. would actually run a meeting. It was amazing. He knew how to twist and turn. Right. Went to ask questions and when not to ask questions. And he uh, he, he he was actually a leader. A leader who decided that he wanted to run for political office. Oh. Remember what I said, you know, everything in life has a timing. Mm -hmm period of time mm -hmm. and uh, he decided that he wanted to run for city council at the same time that we were having another city council uh, contest going oh. so he ran practically out of the same office that was running one election he was running against the uh, a priest that was very well known oh, at the time, and uh, Georgie, uh, you know the the, the, uh, the lines extended to Manhattan and mm -hmm. the Bronx. And it was a remember that I said that you know you go into different yeah. assembly districts. Right. City council goes into different districts. Yeah. So I think that your your grandfather would have been a Council but he was really against the man who grew up in Little Italy, mm. the first Little Italy, which it was actually crossing the bridge, mm. you know, Second Avenue, mm -hmm. to about a hundred and uh, but it, that was the first Little Italy, and then of course they had the uh, Little Italy all the way down by Houston. Yes. Yes. Okay, this little Italy that was there uh, changed very quickly. Yeah. With the years, you know, everything changed. But yeah. your, your, your grandfather would have been an amazing, you know, he knew about housing, he knew about, uh, you know, uh, he was one of the first people that I knew who went into the Lincoln Hospital. Mm -hmm. Remember that I told you that? Construction yes. that would create a brand new link. Ramon and, 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 and Georgie, they created a board, mm -hmm. the advisory board of Lincoln Hospital. So they were the ones that created that. Oh, wow. We all served, all of us, and there were many of us, served as members of that board. Wow. But the one that actually stayed yeah. until practically he passed away yeah, yeah. was your grandfather. Yeah. Not only that, you know, it was a position that you don't get paid, but, but, but he was the chair person of planning board one. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the books, he probably yeah. was there for 100 years. <laughs> Twenty-five years. Yeah. I served. I served there. He, yeah, he served in planning board one. My planning board was two. Okay, so I, I was there for about twelve years. Because oh. this is how you give back to your community, learning what is coming down right. from the different agencies, feds to the city, 
mm -hmm. the feds to the state, state to the city, and how the money plunders down. Mm -hmm. That's where you learn it at the planning boards, you know, what the next project would be. Mm -hmm. you, you see Bruckner Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Okay. All these changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. When I was a member of the community planning board, all those changes were there. They were supposed to have began. And look all the years that have gone by. And this is now that they're actually doing what they were supposed to have done many years back. Mm -hmm. Okay, Making sure that the trucks that are going to the unspoiled markets right. don't cross where the kids are going to school and they, you know, running right through the world. Right. Right, so we extending sort of like an arm right into the uh, terminal markets, and, you know, so, mm -hmm. so, so everything in life is, uh, life is, you know, like this. And interconnected and And we had the privilege of learning from the best. Mm -hmm. We did, we did. And... Uh, your grandfather was loved by many, and in a little bit, you know, when we turn this thing off, I would call the judge <coughs> to see if I can find him and, and see if he's willing to, well, willing he would be. It's just that he's traveling now from Pennsylvania. One of the daughters is in Pennsylvania, and she has a son. And he's sort of like the guy who I could take for people to school. And the other daughter is in Queens. So, so. And, uh, an amazing human being also, you know, someone that we were able to, uh, through, came to Ramon Velez, through Ramoncito, yeah. Luis, through Ramoncito, we, we, we uh, the old man, Ramon, mm -hmm. gave him a job as the uh, attorney for uh, housing and then we, 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 we saw him as a good human being. He was also the, um, uh, the, the attorney for the, you know, Puerto Rico has a um, office, Puerto Rico what they call the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the yeah. office, main office. It used to be in Manhattan. I think that they moved it to uh, Washington now. Yeah, and exactly. The main office is in Washington. Washington. But it used to be in Manhattan. And Luis Gonzalez, the uncle, Luis Gonzalez, it um, was the attorney for the uh, Puerto Rico. Oh, okay. So, so we snatch them. We, Put him in, and he um, became the uh, the attorney for the housing component, mm -hmm. components point, and then we made him a uh, judge. So uh, Hunts Point was not just healthcare; it was also oh no no components. Ah, gotcha. Hunts Point is called multi services center. We have from, at the time, rodent control. Oh. And the rodents that these guys used to pick up they were about this big. Oh my gosh. Like yeah, that rodent uh, yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. We had, you name it, we had from children, mm -hmm. okay? Schooling for children, okay? We were the pioneers. We were the pioneers. See, Hunts Point multi-services. It was yes. actually even has that title with it. Yeah, all that, all that. It was actually an idea that someone had making in the city of New York five counties, five multi-services. Mm -hmm. Ramon got one. Okay. Uh, and then Manhattan got the, we ended up taking Manhattan after uh, another 
area of my life that I talk about, <laughs> but, but, but um, we uh, took over certain uh, agencies. Mm -hmm. The philosophy is actually, you know, community. How can you actually help your community? So, you know, we were, as she said, you know, from education for small children to mental health, mental retardation, alcoholism, uh, methadone. Uh, we were one of the first programs. And there was the whole entity that we had in Manhattan. Frederick was very much part of it. Uh, La Agencia Puerto Rican, uh, what was the uh, correct name? 52nd Street or 51st Street. What PSDP? Yeah. And that, about how many people were employed? Oh, we had 100, we had 100 community workers, because we have a center of staff of 65 or 70 people. And remember that we were talking about those um, places in different communities that yes. they play uh, actually uh, the different community community pue pueblos, yeah. community agencies that were all the pueblos. And this is all the power that we had at that, that time. Was that was that power. When, that when anyone wanted to run for political office, mm -hmm. we're talking about mayor. And we registered, we, in 1973, we registered. We registered 300,000 people. Yeah. We did a and campaign we which we, we, we had different presidentes and vice-presidentes where we ended up also being, you know, we, we, we used to put tables yeah. in different locations to register people right. to vote. That, is mm -hmm. uh, that, that was the biggest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bigger than anything that anybody has seen. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Was it called La Cruzada? The, the Cruzada Civica del Voto. That's what it was. Cruzada yes. Civica del Voto. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then in my legislature, you know, as an assemblyman, yeah. I created uh, with a group of other elected officers, uh, Somos. Okay, Somos. Uno at the time, uh, then changed the name to Somos El Futuro, <laughs> and then uh, I left, and uh, people have carried on with the Somos. Uh, they have forty the fortieth year of Somos. Oh yeah, and the whole idea was actually to, you know, when we created this entity of Somos was to be able, since, remember that I said, we were only five yeah. members of the legislature, okay? And two members, five members of the assembly, and two members in the Senate. The two houses, there were seven of us altogether. Because there was only two mm -hmm. in the Senate, so when I created it, I allowed the two members from the Senate to sort of like join with us, right. not to leave them out there. Right. So the emphasis was the fact that we have learned that if you register people, mm -hmm. people will come out and vote. So the idea was okay, that we would travel from Buffalo to Long Island to the Latino communities. Mm -hmm. Letting them know that they had, even though that they didn't have an assemblyman in their district, they can always contact the five or the two, seven. So, you know, I went around the whole state of New York, traveling back and forth, telling them, you know, and a speaker at the time was a great man. He, he lost the speakership really quickly, but yeah. Mel Miller allowed me to create Somos. 
And it's almost exactly the name that we gave the, you know, the, the uh, parties that we used to throw. But on the legislature, mm -hmm. it was the Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force. Oh. That's what I created. Uh, that's and then, you know, we needed a hand to show people yeah. this is what we have done. So if I don't have this other hand, right. it's almost, I can't tell people what we have been able to do. So the speaker was gracious enough to give me a million dollars. Wow. So we created Somos with the understanding that I would bring. We, we sat down and we looked at the map. Okay, we knew how many uh, assembly members, okay, besides the Latino ones, had at least 15% of Latinos in their communities. So with the million dollars that the man gave me, I used to give them a little bit of money each, okay? so that they can take care of the Latino communities. Mm. So, you know, we began identifying programs, Latino programs in that community. And although we gave the assemblymen the money, the money went to that Latino group. Right. So right. that they can begin getting people elect, uh, registered mm -hmm. and getting people elected. So now, you know, <laughs> There's so many of them that can't count them. <laughs> yeah. But that was the whole idea. That was a big agency. Oh, no. It was Take big. about a thousand people to Puerto Rico every year. Wow. But, but that, wow. was this, that was the other arm, you know, the celebrity. The, being able to show them what we have done. Mm -hmm. Being able to tell them, you know, the type of legislation that we wanted to go ahead and pass. And also, the other thing was also something that I learned when I went to um, I met with a group of Jew, Jewish legislators who went to, you know, to, to, <laughs> I, we went to different places, but we went to Jerusalem and, you know, and, and we saw what they had and, and we saw how they actually used the yeah. members of the legislature. Yeah. So I began saying, wait a minute, we can do that. You know, right. we only have five. How can we do that? What they do when we only have five? And then the whole thing began, you know, we began thinking, wait a minute, you know, it's not, you know, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Let's find out who are their leaders, right. who are the assemblymen. So then we went to speak to the speaker of the assembly. And we told him, this is what we would like to do. And the speaker at the time said, no, what you guys want to do is compete with the blacks. It's not going to happen with me. But speakers were elected. And as soon as that guy left, the next speaker, and that was Mel Miller, before we said that we were back up, mm -hmm. you ask. Right. Can you promise me that you're going to be able to help us? And he said, yes. So he gave us the opportunity to be calm. And then he would say, show me, show me. What is it that you guys do? Show me. And then we began showing him all the articles that I began yeah. research. All those articles, bad stuff that was happening in our communities, you know. Children dropping out of school, drug, crime, all the bad things. And he said, you know, we want to be able to improve, but we can only do that if you help us. And that's how the whole thing was created. So that is Somos. What you see now is sort of like a little different mm -hmm. the way we used to do it. Because mm -hmm. then I used to take the group to Puerto Rico. And I would say to the gringos, you know, we want to go into this uh, town. Let's say Maya West. We're going into Maya West. The mayor is so and so and so and so. This is the plank that I want you to give them. I'll get up and I'll say hello. And then I'm going to call up on you. And this is what I want you to do. To them, it was a big thing. You know? <laughs> oh, you're taking me to Puerto Rico. You're, uh, you know, allowing yeah. me to stay with you guys. 
and you feeding me all this wonderful work. <laughs> can you free <laughs> that? <laughs> uh, oh, oh. So, so this is the way we used to, you know, so I used to allow them to, uh, you know, to get up, make a small speech, and give the mayor of the town, you know, a symbol of who we were. Right. And that's why many people used to open the doors. Mm -hmm. Things have actually changed. They don't usually do that anymore. Mm -hmm. They have sort of like, um, you know, get three or four hotels nearby and people come in and they bring people that are running for different offices in the state and uh, they introduce them and they make speeches. And even so that when I first uh, remember a president by the name of Clinton? Mm -hmm. Send him a letter inviting him. And he says, I can't go, but I tell you what, I'm going to send my wife. Oh. Would that be okay? I said, no. <laughs> I, I, I said, no. But the guy that took over after I left, he said, yes. Yeah, hey, lady. And, and then Hillary came into New York. It was a big thing at Somers. And then she decided that she wanted to run for uh, U.S. Senate from New York State. They actually don't live from here, Worcester County. Yeah. They yeah. still in Worcester County. They moved to... Uh, but I... I you know, I was suspecting. To me, the biggest thing was if I could get him. Right. But that's, you know, looking through my eyes only. All this felt that I should accept the wife. But I just wanted to send the message. You know, we worked for you. We got a lot of people to vote for you. Mm -hmm. So you should calm down. Mm -hmm. But I didn't make the phone call, so maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I only send them a letter. Right. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, was there anything else before we ask the last question um, that you wanted to cover and discuss? The floor is open to you. No. I mean, just the fact that, you know, I was here with sitting at this wonderful place. And I feel that I, you know, contribute yes. Yes, to the historical society because Definitely. as a member of the New York State Assembly from the Bronx, we have our projects, okay, uh, Bronx River restoration mm -hmm. and this place, uh, the zoo, botanical gardens, those are places that you want to make sure that they can continue, okay? And we used to give monies, we used to make sure that monies came down to these groups, okay? So uh, the, also the gentleman that was in charge here many years ago also asked the county clerk, you know, the county clerk is somewhat like this, you know, because the county clerk is actually in charge of all the filings, oh. all the records mm -hmm. within the civil and criminal. Right. So, you know, what we have is actually paper. We do the same stuff. But many, many years back, they had all the type of records and the agency contacted me and, and uh, they wanted to find out how was I going to go ahead and do with those records. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked them, why are you asking? He says, because we'd like to retain them for you. So I said, wonderful. Where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> so just traveling to the back and looking at the uh, wonderful place you have in the back reminded me also of the effort that I did because what happened is, as I told you, that I became the county clerk after a gentleman that had been there for so long. There was no computers when I got in. 
There was nothing actually, everything was handled by hand. Okay? So there's a new era where we have to begin, you know, looking for money because the court system don't give you enough money. Mm. And you know, we, I, I, I told them, we make money for you. You know, you, 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 we, we actually provide money for you. All these cases that we see and, and, and through the, my biggest thing was actually being able to supply uh, uh, people who was to travel and they need passports. Mm -hmm. So I made the biggest oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. passport agency. Oh, wow. It got all messed up when I left. Oh. The next guy didn't keep an eye on it and you know, yeah. hired a family that, 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 that did the wrong thing. And, mm -hmm. So, so they have a small office now dealing with, the, they don't allow them to do a, a yeah. renewals. They only, new applicants only, but they messed it up. But we, I painted, I remember, You decorated? I decorated, <laughs> gave them a whole bunch of I, I beautiful were, things. I was there. Uh, <laughs> The judges that were so impressed, yeah, because he needed, you know, yeah, new and vision, and he and needed new, new eyes, yeah. new to to say, wait a minute. Anywhere you went, you you you, you had a stack of files uh, in the middle of where people were coming. Yeah. 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 You, you can't yeah. have that. You got to. And then I says, wait a minute, computerized. Everything should be computer. You know, everything should be on file. People don't have to touch with their hands my files. We can go ahead and you know. Yeah. So, so that's what. The, so that was my creation. I felt that you know that. The, and this is why they wanted me in the city count. Uh, the city council wanted me to run the uh, city government because they felt that with the background that I had on that, that I can go ahead with the marriage bureau, all those records that they had, you know. Let's I only, just... stayed, only stayed a year. Okay. Because my vision, I, I, I wanted to come back to the community right. and give back. Remember that I told you that you have to, we'll now that you you have all yeah. these things that you have been able to do, you, 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 you were elected, you know, now give it back. Pass it on, you know, continue because there's always going to be people hurting. Right. There's going to be people looking for employment. There's going to be people in substance abuse. There's going to be children that need education. So you try to feed it back into it. Create the new leaders. Right. I was going to ask you, I'm sorry, about that. Because you really had a master class education in what leadership really is, what governing is, right? What would your advice be for the next um, kind of group of, of Latino leaders coming? Um, what advice would you give to them on really how to lead and how to serve the community in the best way? They, they have to take an oath. And the oath would read, you have to care about your community. It's not about you right. stepping into a position thinking about how am I going to get the next position, right. a higher position. It's not about that. It's about actually putting your heart and saying, I'm going to do for my community. Okay? I want to be able to help my community. So that's what it is. It's actually how can I get back? Mm -hmm. How can I actually uh, care for my community? You know, we, we not for anything, but my office used to see, you know, uh, no less than about 80, 90 people a day. Wow. We were open. You know, I used to open on Saturdays. People used to say, you're crazy. Uh, wife complaining, you know, mm -hmm. I never see you. So this is why also, you know, you have to not forget about the family. And, and this is one of the things that I have always 
like the one you come from. The family was in Jersey, far away from this craziness that we had down here. People fighting, and they were secure there. We came. We, we had no choice, but you know, they gotta know who your wife is, they gotta know who your children are. They gotta know that if he looking for Hector Diaz, they can't get Hector. They can call his wife Miriam at public school 25, you know, the only bilingual school at that time in the Bronx. So, you know, so. But honestly, you have to give back to your community and you have to think about how can I help the community. Because, you know, as I said, the ills that we had during the time that I came in, still there. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go anywhere unless you take care of them. Right. You know, and one guy or two guys can't. It's got to be more of us. More of us. Yeah. You know, so that would be the thing. Give me an oath that you're going to care about your community. What makes you feel good at times? Mm -hmm. Marcos Crespo, okay, ex assemblyman, mm -hmm. who, uh, when I left, there was a guy who was there for, for a year, uh, Pedro Spada had a son. He, Pedro became the state senator and he pushed to have his son become the assemblyman when I left. Mm -hmm. Left the vacancy, you know, so he moved in and took Ruben Diaz Jr. ran, but the senator, you know, his son had the same name, so, you know, it's easier for that. During that time, that happened a lot also, which I criticized, you know. Um, love my son, I love my daughter, you know, but, but I want the community to have the best. And sometimes, you know, your children are not the best. Only if you want them to be the best, but, but, but let the people select, mm -hmm. let them have a choice. Don't, don't force it, you know, put them out there. Who do you want? And, you know, and then select people during that time. You know. Carmen Arroyo, I have a daughter. Uh, Jose Serrano, I have a son. Jose Rivera, I have a, uh, a son and a daughter. Okay, and then he became, you know, Tita Tetu, you know, your family, which I felt it wasn't right, you know. So, choices, people have to have choices. But they have to look in deep to make sure that they select someone that is going to care about the community. And he will rise if he takes care of his community. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't take care of the community and he only sees it as a, as a stepping stone, then that's bad. Mm -hmm. Marcos Cruz, you know, he comes to me and he says, you know, Hector, People, when they elected me, they asked me to be like you. A young man who I didn't know, you know, comes over and to say those things to you, you know, so you feel good because he used to be a staff with Ruben Diaz Jr. So Ruben Cito was there for, you know, 10 years, but yet, when he spoke to people on the street, they told him, not that dear, Hector Diaz, I want you to be like him. Because the office was open to whoever came in. One of the things that I used to say to the staff is, you know, it doesn't matter if that person that you see in doesn't live in our district. Take care of them. Let me know who they are so that I can make a folder and let the assemblyman or assemblywoman know that so and so came in for this uh, help, for these needs. And you know, I used to go ahead and send it to them. Mm -hmm. And um, and if the person prefer 
my office, and then the other office. I used to ask them to vote for them anyway, you know. Because that's the way you create friends, mm -hmm. friendships. Because all you have in life is, uh, if you want to go ahead and do a good job, mm -hmm. friends. Yeah. And one phone call. And one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> We like to end all our oral histories with one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? What does the Bronx mean to you? Oh, I think that the Bronx means a lot to me. Okay, because this is where I came from Puerto Rico. This is where I have stayed, never moved. Came to the Bronx, Fox Street, to 452. Period. There was another couple of bad dresses. 452 period. Not only through the assembly, but the same address. City clerk, county clerk, same address. Okay? And you're going to grow your family. Okay? So you want them to make sure that they care about the Bronx the same way that I did. None of them are going to go ahead and enter politics because that's not their stuff. But at least you, 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 you let them know who, what you did. And, you know, they see your signature and my grandson goes into the computer. He says, Papa, what are you, famous? Look at you. <laughs> I says, that's for you to know. And I tell them, let it. You know, you just don't go telling people. You know? So it means a lot to me because this is where I am and this is where I'm staying. I'm not going anywhere. I would just love to actually see the younger people. You know, I was reading uh, a list of um, people in Congress, people that are over 80 years old. Mm -hmm. They had a list of 20 of them. So, you know, feel that after a certain time, Okay, they just don't have the same love, the same feeling. It's like the gentleman who used to take be the county clerk. You know, he, he came back to visit Franco. Mm -hmm. He says, Hector, if I could have known that there was someone out there that was going to go ahead and do this to this office, I would have left. Mm. Mm -hmm. Stay in the job too long is no good. My philosophy was always no more than 15 years of one job. Mm -hmm. Let it go. Go on. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else come in. If you can, train him and make sure that he can do the job. But some of the uh, young kids that I had who wanted to go into politics, they didn't want to hear. You know, I was too old. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. So you laugh, you know, he says, you know, nothing changes, as I said. You know, kids are going to need education, okay? We need to begin going into medical school, okay? We need to be going through all those things that we need. We need our youngsters, you know? But it is what and that's what my, they bought me a cup that says it is what it is. Because <laughs> I keep saying you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see you as the next uh, New York Times. New York Times. <laughs> see you running. Not just writing for them, running. I was just saying about it, the gentleman who passed away, uh, I think he passed away this weekend, Max Gomez. Max was a PhD to call him Dr. Max. But he used to, uh, on TV, he was a good looking guy, yeah. Cuban descent. Um, he used to talk about illnesses, you know, cancer. He used yeah. to talk and he was a dear friend of your grandfather. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he used to go visit, and he used to stop in to see uh, George, because he would talk to some of the doctors at the hospital, and then report from the hospital, because he had uh, he was in channel four, channel two. So he just passed away at the age of 75. Yeah, so too young. Because I'm 80. I'm catching Federico. Don't even, <laughs> yeah. don't even look at though. He's looking good. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to thank you, uh, the Honorable Hector Diaz, for coming here and taking the time out of your schedule. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I am um, uh, always here. Yeah. Just call on phone. You want to go? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. You're welcome.